kind of a, something we started last week that one of the people that are in the call have the chance to ask a question to the group. Does anybody uh, wants to be that person today? No need to be shy. But is that like a general question? Or for whatever? Yeah, just an intro. Oh. Sorry, so loud. An intro question to the group. Like something you're curious to learn about the group. I want to know. Uh, I see all the different groups, and I I don't know. Like uh, for example, the legal group is very easy to know what is this about. But uh, soft go, I don't understand uh, what it means. It, I guess it has to do with with governance, but I don't know. Uh, so the question would be, what what do you do here? Okay, okay, we can go with that in a in a personal way. Everyone answer in like thirty seconds or so what we're doing here, and maybe what is SoftGov for you? Um, okay, I can start. Uh, what I'm doing here is I am very passionate about people and. I am a behavioral analysis freak. I love to observe people and to see what are the patterns and behaviors. So, so I'm excited about this group. And I'll pass to Juan. Well, um, I think soft governance um, is like, um, the complementary part that uh, um, technological um, system needs because um, like te te technology is programmed and they always behave the same, but um, humans are chaotic and we are unpredictable. So that's why we need uh, soft governance rules that um, um, complement with the system uh, with um, like rules, hard coded rules and soft rules with for humans, and uh, yeah, that's for me. And I will pass it to Mateo. Sure. Uh, for me, I always take uh, like an analogy that if there is soft governance, there must be a hard governance. So that hard governance are those rules or those impositions that needs to be done so the system or the community remains a. Uh, stable and working. The soft governance is as we are trying to, to build some dyna dynamism in the system, we need the human behavior to be consistent and, and really effortlessly working through the benefit of everyone. And that's between the interaction of each part, uh, hoping for the best of, of the whole. So soft governance is the only way that we can uh, uh, resolve that issue. I'll pass it to Septimus. Yeah, related with uh, what Mateo was saying, for me, uh, soft governance is like, uh, like oh, I just, uh, the complement of uh, legal. Because, uh, for example, la last time I was asking uh, a question on the legal world, King Group, and it was about soft governance. Like, I think for me, uh, legal is like the, the law, but soft governance is like for the people. Like, Follow, follow that role on uh, for the people uh, and I'll pass it to Craig hello I missed uh, what what are we saying uh, we're talking about what soft governance for you yeah I'm just gonna pass um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we'll come back to you, Craig. I'll, I'll save you. Um, so the question is like, what is soft governance? And uh, Tom was just like, what is this working group even about? 
And, uh, and so uh, we went improv style with like, okay, this is our entry question. What is soft governance about to, to each of us and why are we here? Uh, so the reason I'm here is because I think soft governance is the most critical piece of any kind of DAO. And we want to build a DAO around public goods for token engineering economy, uh, for token engineering commons, I mean. And uh, so we need to really nail down our soft governance there. It's about cultural norms and understanding. I and mean, it's, it's going to be blatantly obvious to anyone in this group because we're going to launch a DAO in a few weeks like a, a, an economy that we just say, oh yeah, this is a test. The soft governance, the the understanding, the cultural, like the shared knowledge uh, that we all have, that this is soft gov, this is the the piece. We're all deciding this is a test. It's going to be on main. It's going to be on XDAI with real money. If we all decided it was the launch, then it would be the launch. And it's about understanding how do we manage this unwieldy beast of like shared knowledge, common knowledge, and uh, you know the, the social norms that we use to interact with each other. We can manage certain amounts of our governance with the tech. We can say code is law, but uh, obviously it's, it's, code isn't law. There's, there's, there's holes in the law. If, if it is, there's holes in it. So we need to fill it with soft gov. And, and the big thing with soft gov is that we need to nail all of Ostrom's principles. Sorry, did I break up there? Uh, we need to nail all of Ostrom's principles. And that's soft, for me, that's SoftGov's main objective is to just make sure all the principles are checked off. Legal has one principle and uh, uh, Juan, uh, ha for, uh, Juan Carlos for, for gravity has like three of them. And, and then the tech even might have, a, have some say on some of these, but it's really soft governance job to make sure all of them are checked. Okay, sorry, too long. Uh, I'll pass it to Santi. Uh, what I understand from soft governance is that this is the most important and the most challenging job of, of our project. Uh, everything is soft governance. Most of the DAOs have been created from tech people, people who just lives in blockchain and understands absolutely all the technical things that we are dealing or are intending to deal with or some. We intend to approach people who may not know anything about what we are technically doing. And we got to make them feel that they wanna they wanna participate, that they wanna invest, that they wanna join. And 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 that's the most challenging job. And and it's not easy. And just to, we can we can take a look. Just the group is, since the group started, there is two groups that have come out of sub governance, which is uh, which is uh, conflict management and, and legal. And there is onboarding also. So there's three of them, and and that's because there's a lot of work to do. And uh, the the technique. I'm I'm not saying that the rest of the, the the people is important. Tech guys are are key here also. But once everything is launched, that that job is done. And and the rest of the group keeps being here and keeps keeps the machine working and and keeps everything moving. So uh, it's it's really important and and that is the reason I'm I'm participating in this group. Uh, I'm gonna pass it to Tonga. Hey, okay, thank you. Now it's uh, much clearer. Um, only uh, one like with comes. Like for me, I will tell you at first I started seeing the, the Discord server and I was like, well, wow, this is, I'm from Argentina, so I didn't go to university here. And and be, one of the reasons was because I, I keep arguing with so many people that university is not necessary or that I can learn much cooler stuff online, but I never had an opportunity to meet so many people so smart at the same time. So for me, self governance was like a, a, cha a channel on the Discord server and and a way to connect to all of you. And well, not not only self governance, just like all the token engineering uh, uh, the server. Um, 
So I, I was wondering only what is the difference with comms? Like comms is more like interpersonal or uh, well, uh, that, that, that I still don't understand. We can get more into it in, in more detail. Like basically the difference is that comms is communications and soft gov is uh, governance in a very uh, simple way to say it. But we're doing an introduction now to start the call. So you proposed this great question and there's still uh, Ata, Tamara, Dan, Dan uh, that still didn't go. So I'll pass to Ata. Okay, okay. sorry. Yeah, um, I think um, emphasizing this human part is very true. Um, and it's also the first thing that comes to my mind with soft governance. What I feel is, you know, being in crypto, it's much less about kind of um, making sure that kind of like a structured organization works, but um, more so it's about the energies of people and their ideas. And like there's these kind of like extraordinary levels of commitment, energy, um, enthusiasm. And then I think the most important part about soft governance for me is to be able to harness this in a way that makes a project sustainable and also um, functioning. And, um, yeah, that's why I think like soft governance, especially in crypto is like, I cannot find the right words, but like special, unique because of Crypto is also specific nature and how it feels for people participating in it. Um, who didn't have a chance to talk? Pass to Tamara. Ah, Tamara, yes. Pass it to Tamara. Okay, um, I'm happy to go next. I'm probably going to keep this uh, very short because uh, with respect to the time we have left. Um, I am here to uh, listen to people like Juan and Livia and um, Santi and, and their uh, their passionate understanding of SoftGov and to absorb some of that uh, information and importance from them. And as well, I understood from a previous meeting that we might be discussing the direct direction change in the project, which is why I jumped on this call uh, for, for that reason as well. Uh, and I think, um, Dan, did you go already? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I can go. I can go. <laughs> um, yeah, at first, I, I mean, like, uh, I was, I know it's at least 100% sure what the call is about, <laughs> but it reminded me of participatory budgeting, for example, and it reminded me, uh, and it made me think of, for example, uh, system of governance uh, that is as flexible and adaptive that it can encompass every stakeholder. So it's easy to engage for about anybody at any point in time. Um, thinking about the text side, it reminds me of the concept of Maturana's autopoiesis. So a system that is capable of reproducing and maintaining itself. So I don't know if that is a goal, but it's, it's a beautiful way of thinking about DAOs, I think. So yes, um, who else is there? Uh, Jessica came, I, uh, but I don't know if she knows the question. <laughs> Jess, we're, we're answering what is SoftGov for you? you want me to answer now? I can say <laughs> you, you can. Uh, you know, I was, to be honest, a bit confused about this term as well, like Grace. I was kind of like, what's soft governance? Um, I still think it's, maybe i don't know it's kind of a funny term i like culture better like sits well with me um i feel like it's culture i feel like it's holding down the house it's like the how we want people to feel 
feel like it's taking on the kind of like nurturing role to see that everybody has what they need and that they feel good and can make babies like conflict management and different things to focus on. Yeah, for me, I guess it's culture and like vibes and just like having everybody feel like there's a solid foundation underneath them that they're safe and that. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'll move on because otherwise we'll. we'll uh, be short on time but that was very cool to listen all of your answers and Jeff if you wanna if you want to jump in you can you can do it for 30 seconds like a really quick sure hi of what do you think soft gov yeah I guess for me soft gov is kind of the Moving past like the game theoretic kind of like hard governance, like algorithmic governance, like this is the the conviction voting type, you know, governance is is one thing, but it doesn't handle a lot of the nuance of you know human dynamics. And I think this is where we can bring the humanity into DAOs is with this kind of another layer of governance. And I think that's an important part of governance. There's no one answer to it. There are multiple layers. And I, I really like soft governance because it brings in a human layer to you know, these kinds of decision makings rather than just this hard algorithmic governance layer that a lot of DAOs uh, have. So I think that's that's my view of SoftGov and really happy to be here as well. Thank you. I love what some of you say, like along the time that we start to pick these phrases, like Zeptimus just had a gold one, like SoftGov is for the people. <laughs> And Juan said something uh, another time too, that what is the difference between law and, and just social agreements that, that people have, like hard law and soft law? There's not much of a difference because like everything we leave in society is based on social agreements, even, even money, like everything that has value, right? Um, so yeah. Something we're going to talk about today is uh, rules and boundaries. And I think that's a very, it's a bit of a hard topic here uh, in the, it feels so open, everything, the, the, the system that we are. So it's very important that we understand what are these granular uh, rules and boundaries that are emerging from our culture. And it's important that they are emerging and we just, perceive them and not that we are like creating them or imposing them. So um, I want to maybe Griff, do you, do you think it's, it's better to, for you to start? I have, there is a, a doc on, on the Softcraft obviously, channel. Obviously I can, but I would say that when I start, it'll probably just like, go off into a crazy world. So if there are things that you wanted to like make sure we accomplish, we could save me for the end. Okay, so so let's maybe just put a framing into what Griff is gonna talk about that we can have this like open ears to pick from everything he's saying. What are the implicit rules and boundaries there? And then we'll continue this exercise to other rules and boundaries that we that we can identify already. If you guys can jump in uh, in the document that it's in the in the softgov chat, I can share my screen quick. Just so this is the this is the Austrian principles document with all the principles and. And some questions and some of the topics that it's important for us to focus on. So the second, the first and the second uh, principles are commons need to have clearly defined boundaries and rules need to fit local circumstances. And of course, uh, Ostrom wrote this based on physical commons and we have a cyber commons. So some of the things have to be adapted and we need to understand what is the, what is the rules and boundaries of our, of our cyber 
sometimes permissionless uh, system. So that wasn't so clear for me, the difference between rule and boundary. And I went to the dictionary and I pulled it out. So rule is one of a set of explicit or understood regulations or principles governing conduct within a particular activity or sphere. So regulations or principles, I see this very much as agreements in our case. And boundary is a line that marks the limits of an area, a dividing line, or a limit of a subject or sphere of activity. So this is very interesting for us to um, not limit the subject that we're speaking of, but have some type of uh, a line there of until where this token engineering goes and of course we would need uh, a lot of token engineer experts to help answer this question but i think we can already uh, pull some things out of there so before passing to griff i just want to have a quick a quick round to see if is, is there any rules and boundaries that you already identify that when we talk about that, that like pops up in your mind? I'll pass to Jeff. Not everyone needs to speak if you don't want, but let's pass to everyone. And then if you don't want to speak, you can pass. Sorry. This is rules that uh, rules that don't match the the situation. Can you repeat the question, Libby? Sorry. Yeah, rules uh, rules and boundaries that you can identify on the top of your head that we have in the TEC. If if any, and you're muted, Jeff. um like a rule or boundary like uh personal boundaries you mean or sorry i'm a bit lost on the context here i i can try to take it i can try i'm going to try to sure. take it and i'll pass it so <clears throat> i see this as two things so there's the rules that we have right now but i think the more useful part of this exercise is getting ready for launch because we have the rules now we, we set those up we have the boundaries now we set those up uh, for our build, but then what happens post launch uh, and with the integration of, of, of a few things. So once we've actually launched a token and we have uh, a, that, that will be a clear boundary. Uh, anyone who has the TEC token is part of the TE Commons. And uh, I also think that there are other boundaries around uh, social media platforms, for instance, people on Discord, uh, people who follow us on Twitter. Uh, people who, you know, read our uh, comments on Medium or uh, participate on the forum. Uh, these are these are a little bit like, I would say like the clear boundary is do you hold TEC token? Uh, and then the next boundary out is like, are you participating in the conversation? And then the next boundary even further is do you consider yourself a token engineer or are you a, a, you know, a token engineering expert of some sort that would benefit from the result of our, our work, which is T public goods. So kind of like the benefactors of the TE commons. Uh, but those, uh, those concentric rings are, it, it kind of gets to be gray. And one of Eleanor Ostrom's principles is like defining a clear boundary. And I think the clearest boundary that we can define is TEC token holders. Uh, as far as rules matching local circumstances, uh, I, I really see a lot of this coming out of uh, conflict res and, and the gravity work, uh, making sure that uh, we have uh, feedback on the rules as, as we go. But the clear rules that I see are code of conduct uh, and, um, you know, the bounding curve and the tech rules, uh, like if you put in your, in the, there's an exit tribute, an entry tribute, uh, the rules around conviction voting. Uh, these are, these all these rules that are defined in tech are part of the rules as well. Uh, but then we have soft governance rules, which are like, 
oh, if you swear in this, if you swear in Discord, you know, what do we do? You know, we got to have some kind of graduated sanction there. So uh, that's probably enough for me. I'll pass it to Zeptimus. Well, I don't have that much to add, but I think like uh, uh, those rules, it's uh, yeah, it's just got connect some uh, just connect somehow with conflict management. But uh, but yeah, don't don't matter to add like with grief says it's pretty clear. Uh, and I'll pass it to Jess. I'll pass to Dan. Uh, <laughs> I, I will pass it uh, to Juan. Juan, you're muted. Sí. Um, I have one question, and it's like hmm, we all come from different parts and um there's when we enter to the to the tc then we are like equal but there are these um like um boundaries like physical boundaries that i don't know if can apply here in the cultural boundary or something like if if we come from different parts, is that a cultural boundary, um, or like a, a a cultural rule for for our organization? Uh, it's like a question. I am not sure if, if my thoughts are clear on this. It's like yeah, it's like yeah, cultural boundaries. And in, when we are in, in the TC, yeah, we have our common cultural boundaries, but do we have subjective cultural boundaries related to our, like, um, yeah, our, our history or, or where we come, we come from? I don't know, it's like a question, I, I maybe be vague on this. So uh, I, I will pass it. I think it's related with what uh, Grief said of social media, that entering our Discord channel is somehow of a boundary as if you were entering like a room or or something like that. I think it, it, it is, yeah. Definitely, I, I like that framing as well, Livia, that these are almost like, you know, these different channels are like our different, um, office rooms, you know, we meet in Discord for some things, we meet, uh, you know, in our email inboxes for other things, you know, email is more of a, um, you know, an outbound update, whereas Discord is more of like the, you know, the, the meeting room where we all meet face to face. Um, and I think those bounds, you know, there are economic bounds, um, you know, which is the TEC token holders, there are governance bounds, um, there are social bounds, um, there are, yeah, I, I think these are all, um, You know, it's it's a little bit um, of a stretch to to take these into the digital realm, but basically wherever any um, you know um, group comes together, you know, you can draw a boundary around that system. And different uh, digital tools serve different digital purpose, uh, different purposes for you know our digital community. Um, you know, some more like a water cooler, others more like a bulletin board, perhaps. Um, and yeah, we each of these kind of has its own um, social expectation or rules that uh, that you know, govern its, their use so that they're useful tools for us as a community. Yeah, that's interesting to explore more in depth uh, later. Uh, what are the different rules of each one of the rooms that we've been using? Because uh, maybe this court has a little bit of a different culture than the forum and and maybe it's interesting to go into those and see if there's anything hidden about uh, behavior as well. But we can do that um, maybe later because I, I do want to give space to Griff to get into all the juicy news, and then we can we can all pay attention on what he's saying on the, based on this context of like what of this proposed changes 
would affect our rules and boundaries and and how we can start to distill them and put them in the in the dock. Yeah, and I want to minimize the the change. It, it's not a big change. It's really just adding one extra step. It's like a a two part launch instead of a one part launch. Uh, the general idea is okay. Let me say what the original idea was. That hey, we're going to launch everything all at once. We're going to launch that. The all the code base will be ready at one moment, and we will have a hatch, and automatically the funds from the hatch would go to the augmented bombing curve and conviction money, and that would all be automatic. But the proposal is to add an extra step in the middle, where we have the hatch and uh, everything happens the exact same way that we imagined before. But after the hatch, we require the dandelion the people who participate in the hatch to have to vote to add in the augmented bonding curve and conviction voting and so it does change the rules uh it and it it does change the boundaries uh which is beneficial for legal hugely beneficial for legal and also hugely beneficial for tech because the complicated pieces of the tech are the augmented bonding curve and conviction voting and those pieces would have the time of the hatch to find more bugs and find more issues with them. So those are the two big wins <laughs> with this extra addition of, uh, uh, oh, sorry, th that's the tech win. The big, the big pro for the legal side is when people buy into the hatch, there's no expectation of profit. In fact, they have to take the step to say, no, we're going to put the, the funds in this pot into the augmented bonding curve. In, and really in, implement both into what OneHive calls the gardens template. So uh, that makes our lives easier because when people are buying into the hatch, they're buying tokens that are going to be worth less than the what they put in. And that's really easy. You don't have to you don't have to have any major crazy legal agreements to say, hey, you know, put money here and some of it's going to be donated. The rest will be collectively governed. That's way easier than put money here, you'll get a token and there'll be a market for it in, where it's instantly worth more. Instead, we can uh, more easily say they are sufficiently decentralized. These people had to vote to upgrade to this next path. So big wins on the tech side and on the legal side. Challenges for the, the onboarding group, they have to say, hey, hatchers, when you buy in, you know, uh, you're going to lose money right away. Before, we could say, hey, when you buy in, you know, you're, you're going to get tokens that are worth X times, you know, more than what you put in. That's really nice. That's way easier sell. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to throw that out there. Uh, but, of course, they have to just say, this is the case. But then we have this upgrade plan where we can put that money into a bonding curve if the people who hatch the comments agree. Uh, it's 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 a nice it's still it's still there it's not a huge loss but it adds complication and this of course impacts comms as well because it adds this extra complication it's extra step that has to be explained that when you put money in you're going to get tokens that are worth less than you put in but then we have a plan of putting this portion to the augmented bargaining curve and this portion to conviction voting that will be <clears throat> that will be an extra challenge and then softgov has to you know has to also deal with the ambiguous situation where uh, you know people have to understand the the hard governance will change the the future of the organization and how to get people to vote for that first vote and and all of these things you know I, I think it ends up uh, impacting softgov as well. So that's that's the long story short. I, maybe I'm missing a big point uh, that there's some questions, but so I, I'd be curious to hear some questions. I do feel like there's a big point, and that I think it could have a huge impact on the race. I think possibly negatively because I think people will be more hesitant and maybe put way lower amounts, not knowing and having like the certainty that. This is going to go to the bonding curve being dependent on the open governance of it. Perhaps there's a blend or hybrid plan where we could open when 
dandelion goes to the abc to have a second uh, pre-hatch or vesting period i don't know if there's a hybrid possibility but i do feel like this is going to greatly impact the amount of funds that we raise and it does kind of touch on people's boundaries of how much skin in the game am i really willing to put for not a guarantee and it doesn't feel like maybe to me, like my immediate trigger, and I'm not saying that this is correct. I'm just saying my first reaction is like, oh God, this doesn't feel safe. Like before, I know where it's going. I know what's happening. But um, I think that could impact the race. And then I, I also am still a little confused what this looks like. Like, so we donate to the dandelion and then we don't get any tokens. Then everybody votes together to put that as a buy-in to hatch augmented bonding curve and then receives an equal amount of tokens or tokens based on what they put in or i still am confused like what if you can map from example of like put in x and mm -hmm. this is what happens sure so people uh so here's the mapping uh people would participate in the hatch just as they had uh you would have to you probably have to have c stack tokens we probably, we wouldn't have to do any KYC uh, for sure. We, we wouldn't have to do, uh, we wouldn't have to be so s limited on the people that participate per se. Uh, but uh, but we, we probably still want to make sure that they're token engineering people and that they, you know, we still want to have the limitation of, we're not looking for speculators to participate. Uh, but. Yes, so then when people put into the hatch, once it reaches its final goals, tokens are created. In fact, tokens will probably be created the second people put money into the hatch. They will be issued tokens. Uh, and then at the end of the hatch, the, depending on how much is raised, uh, the impact hours will be also rewarded with tokens. So uh, people who earn impact hours will get tokens. Uh, and then all of those tokens will be uh, part of the dandelion DAO. The dandelion DAO will have two pots of money. One that's uh, geared towards the augmented bonding curve and one that's, that's supposed to be allocated to the conviction voting DAO. So uh, now the dandelion DAO will have to pass a proposal to say, send this money to augmented bonding curve and send this money to conviction voting DAO. So there is this one extra step. Uh, and then after that, everything would be the same. The same token would be part of the bonding curve. Its value would have skyrocketed because now it's backed by uh, the bonding curve, kind of like when um, Panvala or anybody puts, when, it, when someone has a token like Seeds, Seeds has a token and they just decide to put it in uh, to a, to a um, uh, someone decides to put that token into Uniswap at a certain price. Boom, now it has that price because it's backed by this collateral. And so we would have the same situation for the same token. Ideally, it'd be the same token. Worst case scenario, it would be a new token. And these other tokens would just be the same one for one. But the same people would have this token and this token. This token would be worthless. There's a potential for two tokens here, like a token swap, basically. Or there's the potential that hopefully we can just keep the same token. And then we would continue. We would have the augmented bonding curve. Anyone could buy into the bonding curve at that moment after the dandelion vote. And uh, also the people could start passing proposals and conviction voting. We'd still have the same vesting requirements. We'd have the same rules altogether. We're really just adding this one extra piece that hopefully before the hatch even starts, everyone would see that this vote is proposed in the forum. It's it's going to happen people have signaled support uh and that it's it's just a matter of like having the people who put money in agree to that possibility the other piece is the people who put money in would be able to pull their money out before that if they don't like it in fact the people who put money in would be able to pull all of their money back out because we would have the redemptions out all the, except, well, all the money that's not the conviction vote. All the money not to the doubt. Which token would be worthless? Uh, well, the original token, we so that there's a debate. It, the tech team hasn't scoped it out if they can keep the same token 
uh, from the hatch, or if they have to just launch the uh, the a new DAO with a different token, but for all the same people. So that's that's still we don't know. I mean, we have to see if ideally we keep this token, but worst case scenario, for sure we can do this, where everyone who has this token, the token from the hatch, uh, would then be able to uh, swap it for. Well, they wouldn't even have to swap it. They'd just be airdropped the same number of tokens in the new DAO that has the money in the bonding curve and the money in the connection button. But that's like that's really a technical thing. It's just on Ether Scan. There'd be two tokens or one. I think in terms of culture, that's really interesting because because people would have to be so much more informed when they join, and and the 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 chances that they would actually be aligned with the mission and the values and be aligned with the project as a whole, having to understand how to uh, make changes into the DAO and and having that like small risk that uh, maybe that wouldn't happen, even though like there's so much signal for that to happen. I think that's that that's actually perfect. Like that's the type of hatchers that we want, right? That would be willing to to donate in the first place and that wouldn't be so interested in financial gain off the off the bonding curve. Yeah, effectively it would be like a Moloch DAO for token engineer is how it would start. And then the first vote, or Meta Cartel or Moloch DAO, because that's what a dandelion DAO is. It's just the Argon version of all the same rules for Moloch. Right. And then uh, it'd be like that, but with a plan to make a bonding curve as their first vote. Or the first vote would be what percentage to give to the conviction voting pool, what percentage to go to the bonding curve. No, that would be built in from the beginning. We uh, would. The hatch tribute, uh, the amount that goes to conviction voting. Of pool there and the amount that goes to augmented bonding curve, that would be clear from the beginning. We would want to keep as many things clear from the beginning as possible. Uh, still, like that, just as before, uh, the hatch tribute, the you know impact hours uh, algorithm, how people get rewarded for impact hours, and everything else that was part of the hatch, with vesting, all those rules would still be uh, applied. It's just that. After that, they would have to approve a vote that would also already basically be like the plan, but they would have to actually take action and vote. Question is, of course, we don't have any of those rules sorted out yet, like the exact parameters. That's what we get to debate over the forums in the next couple months, uh, including what the hatch tribute should be, uh, and also including what the quorum requirement for that vote would be. For instance, could be just one percent if we had to. So the hatch tribute would be like an X dot in a common pool that would be running, and then the to tokens would be assigned based on what. Sorry, you broke up there. Like you're saying, people would donate. Part of the tribute would be like whatever 10 or 20 percent that would go immediately to the conviction voting. And then the other percent would be assigned tokens. Like, what would the tokens? How would you, you said one for one, and then that would be voted to be reserved to launch the bonding curve? Yeah, all these parameters need to be debated. Okay. Yeah, all these parameters need to be debated. Uh, but the general idea would be that uh, the people would get tokens based off of how much they donate. And it's not really going to change depending on how much the tribute is. But what would change is that like, when people put money in, there would be an, an entry tribute, uh, the hatch tribute. And the hatch tribute would say 20% goes to this pot, which you can't withdraw from. Uh, that pot is allocated for token engineering, public good projects, 
which is a cultural understanding that we would agree to. Everyone who buys in has to agree that uh, the hatch tribute percent is going to token engineering public goods. And then, yeah, the other percent, anyone who has the token engineering commons token, uh, maybe we call it the token engineering commons hatch token, uh, if there is a two token system, uh, then they would be able to withdraw the money that they put in minus the hatch tribute at any time. If they don't like the vote, then they would be able to withdraw with their token, they'd be able to withdraw the, that, uh, that portion. And they would, uh, but they would also lo lose governance over that 20%. Why well, did you say that everyone would have to agree that the hatch tribute goes to public goods? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they would, they would have to agree that they're donating a portion of their funds, that a portion of their funds is meant for the common, the token engineering commons, you know, and, and like the public good of public goods in the token engineering space. And the other portion of their funds is for building an economic experiment, right? Like that, that would be part of the the understanding of when you're buying into this, it's like, okay, we're going to use this portion of funds that's going to fund pub token engineering public goods. This other portion of funds, we're going to put it into a bonding curve. And they would know that going in, that, that they're going to vote for that, or that vote's going to be on the table. And also the parameter of, I mean, I guess it would make, I mean, it would make sense that the tribute is a donation, so you wouldn't receive tokens for that. So it'd be like basically you get tokens on the 80%, which would then be swapped for if there's a second token and for one after the hatch or something. But that would all need to be decided. Yeah, and it wouldn't even be swapped. It would be airdropped to all the people who have that token. It, they wouldn't have to take any action. They would just be able to go to that DAO and start voting like it was the same token. I want to get a sense of the room of how people are following, understanding this conversation. Can I ask one more question. Wouldn't I if was, you air tokens sorry, that affects the supply and therefore the price? Sorry. If you airdrop tokens, wouldn't that affect the supply? would affect the price like would that have a weird effect it on would that? be it would be a new token so uh, I, I mean the technical details of token isn't clear and this is a always a challenge hopefully it'll just be the same tokens now the same tokens would have the a new price which would be whatever the bonding curve says but no that there the whatever we do will not affect the price well, it would affect the price just because when there's a bonding curve, now the price is higher. Because the, instead of just pulling, the, the, the curve is under collateralized. Then there would be two okay. conviction voting pools, the one until it runs out, and then the second one with the gardens DAO. Would be the like first one will not actually have conviction voting. It will just be funds allocated to the side that will go into a conviction voting DAO. The main thing is that the tech team wants more time to get audits on the conviction voting and they wanna use that hatch time. So that money would just be in a vault that would be able to be voted on if, you know, with a certain quorum majority and all these things uh, to do something with. But there wouldn't be conviction voting uh, uh, during the hatch. It would just be, it'd basically just be the initialization of a Moloch DAO for token engineering with the plan to make a first step of putting the funds the, into conviction voting and augmented bonding curve through votes. Santi, you wanted to say something? Uh, when I was listening to this airdrop, uh, it came to my mind that uh, if we do an airdrop, we're giving away something and that might reverse the nice legal things that we had for just asking for donations, but since it will be an airdrop out of a uh, voting from the decentralized uh, the DAO, I think we're covered. But we have to think a little bit more on that. It, it won't, it, the airdrop piece is, that's just my bad word. Don't think 
So I think there's too much baggage around the word airdrop. It's not, it's not an airdrop. It would really just be a, a, a non, like a token swap. Everyone who has this, like a token change, like uh, Ocean did this. Ocean just straight up said, okay, yeah, we had that token. We're going to lock that token. And it'll never be transferred again. You can never use that token. And we're going to give everyone who had that old token a new token. It's just a different token contract. In the end, tokens are packages of rights. And, you know, there's like the, on the Ether scan, it's a new token. But for the people, the rights are the same. The rights, you know, the it's. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. The whole point, the whole point is, uh, is that the swap or airdrop or however you want to call it comes from a decision taken from the DAO, Dandelion DAO, and yeah. that's that's it. That's the that's the whole point. Sufficiently decentralized. Uh, but I like Livy's idea of passing it around. Uh, I'm curious to hear Manu. What do you think, Manu? Um, well, I think that I think that it's, it makes absolutely sense to do it like that. Uh, however, I'm wondering um, how how do you how do you envision that transition from the first token to the second token? Would it be just that you will um, you will stop the other contract and then just uh, swap it for the new one, or will would it be that the user will not the user the humans will need to come in and claim the token by themselves? No, they wouldn't have to claim anything. It would it would just be like they're on this website, they made the vote, and then okay, they so go to the other website, and they would and it would just work. Okay, so they don't they don't even they won't even notice that uh, the change happened then. No, they won't notice. The tokens will not, the token wasn't transferable in the first place, so we don't have to worry about scammers or anything like that. The token that we launch with will not be transferable, so you couldn't try to say, oh, look, I have the original TEC token, you know, like, no. You, yeah, you do, but it's just sitting there. It's, it becomes like a badge on your Ether scan. And then, <laughs> uh, and then you have the actual token that starts doing interactions. Like, if you look at Ether scan, you might notice but the website should just like even be the same website. Gov.te Commons on the back end will just point it to a different DAO, right? It'll be like, oh, it's pointed at this DAO at 0x3, blah, blah, blah. Now we're moving it to 0x4, blah, blah, blah. And people go to the same website, they can vote, everything's the same. Perfect. So the, the transition seems, uh, it seems like it's gonna be very, very easy then. Mm -hmm. They'll just have to make that one vote after the hatch. Right. Yeah, makes sense. So it's, pretty it much, so it's pretty much. Uh, oh, it's pretty much as uh, Moloch then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it starts with a Moloch that transitions to uh, a bonding curve. Got it. Uh, okay, then I pass it to uh, Jeff. Yeah, I would just say I can see both sides. <laughs> so I'm kind of, uh, yeah, just interested to hear what other people have to say. Mateo? Nope, nothing to add. Uh, I'll pass it to Juanca if you have something to say. No, I think it's good and it uh, adds a little bit of complexity on the onboarding and on the soft go, but it's nothing that um, we cannot like uh, commit on doing. And I will pass it to Septimus. Uh, I think that's actually a very good thing. Like, uh, like when you're onboarding people, it's it's very like to think like uh like Livia was saying it's very to uh like uh when you onboard people it's not like hey here like you're going to raise your money that's i mean yeah it's easier to uh fund the project but uh, at the same time uh now with that thing it's going to be better because uh, you have a more solid um uh, uh, community and i think that's great i think that's actually great like, and, and it also helps the legal so i, I think it's win-win from 
both sides. Like for me, in my point of view. Uh, and I'll pass it to Tonga. Yeah, I don't have much to add. I'll pass it to Santi. I already talked. I think it's uh, from the legal point of view, it's uh, much, much, much way better. It's amazing how switching through something that proposed technical, uh, we are making, taking away our, our responsibility in such a way. I love it. Uh, of course, there's, there's, I can understand Jess's point of view. It's, uh, somehow kind of harder to tell people put your money here you're going to lose it some way but that's that doesn't really have to be the message i mean the message for every single crypto project is put here your money and we're, we're going to try to grow something here and that's that's what the message is going to be uh, how we do it uh, of course we're going to we're going to try to do it the best way for everyone but uh, but it's not like we have to tell them, okay, put your money here, you're gonna lose it right away. We can try to find the best message to try to, you know, approach everyone and, and get the most out of the hatchers. But legally, it's it's um, it's amazing. I, I, I love the way it makes uh, things much, much simpler. I'll pass it actually, to, uh, no, go, go, ahead, to yes. go ahead. Actually, um, I think we it have could be a meme. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna say that i have to leave because we're starting the the book club right now i know it's a marathon of calls but if any of you still want to join uh surprisingly it was the do the winner so i'm jumping in there now and you guys feel free to continue the conversation here and thanks so much for coming thank you yeah. i have to go to with livia well Atta, did you did club. you have one last comment Atta, before you leave, did you have a comment on uh, this? I want to say something. We, we uh, can stay. No, we can because, stay. Uh, I don't. Uh, I want to say something. I, I Sorry, think yeah. I'm that well informed yet about these processes to like make uh, you know valid comments, and I can create sentences, but I, I don't. It will be a meaningful one. Yeah, that's fair. So, Sorry, Juan. Cheers. Thanks, Atta. Um, I, wa I want to say something that um, taking into account that we are connected in this call, um, I would like uh, people in this call to, to participate in the doodle that I sent uh, in the TEC general uh, because uh, it's for setting a friendly schedule for the gravity um, conflict management working group because there's people there's a lot of people that has um, like participated and uh, shown interest but we have uh, had uh, like troubles with the weekly call so I'm proposing uh, like uh, two two times um, one is tomorrow and the other one is, is Thursday for um, for you to pick the one that suits you better. Great job, thank you, Juan. Yeah. I, I tried to uh, did that doodle, but somehow I, I couldn't. Like maybe I don't know if I have to log in somehow, create an account or not. But uh, in any case, both uh, times are okay for me. So I, I, I both are good. Okay. I'll vote for you, Zap. <laughs> okay. Thank. Okay. I I was curious to to listen. How would a meme work for? making the understanding better i think that was you yes that that mentioned that i mean would would allow us to would you like to explain how oh uh, no i was just gonna say like it's kind of funny <laughs> like yeah every other crypto project in the history of crypto projects is like big gains to the moon i think we could make a story and narrative about put your money here you're gonna lose it and actually it's more like the narrative of sacrificing the individual for the whole and like we are a cooperative who is trying to fund public goods and i think the problem with DeFi is the focus on individual gains versus like community so maybe there is like it's a legal hack but maybe there's like a comms hack 
and like twisting it a little bit and making like memes. Yeah, you put your money here. You lose as an individual, but you gain as a community. So it was just a thought from what San Santi said. That could be like something we could run with. I like that. I think it's also less less about, you know, like put your money where you're going to lose it, but let's make DAO decisions as a DAO. I think this is just pushing like all of the decisions to the group because this removes, you know, the personal or the, the individual or organizational legal um, issue by deciding everything as a DAO. So essentially we're just going like all in on the DAO, you know, hey, we want to do these things but we want to make sure everyone that's involved wants to do these things. Um, I think that every time we add an additional like step of complexity, I mean, you want to get the most number participating, just tell people, you know, put your money here, number go up, you know, you're going to get people from all over the world putting money into a speculative crypto project. You know, this happens all the time in the crypto space. Um, but the more we say, you know, hey, we want to use this money responsibly. We want to steward this community as a DAO. We want to, you know, ask you guys to make decisions as we go along. We're going to get less and less, you know, people participating in the hatch. But I think we will also get more um, qualified people in the hatch, people who are, you know, willing to uh, dive into the complexities of this stuff. Um, I guess the question is, yeah, how how small is too small? Um, and yeah, I'm just want to make sure that we still appeal to a wide enough base of token engineers that we're going about this the right way. Um, and that, you know, ultimately this money is going towards building public goods that we can all use in the token engineering space. And I think that's just what we have to keep coming back to. We're just trying to do this the most responsible way possible. Yeah. Uh, anyone else have a comment bef uh, I, before we jump? Uh, well, uh, Santi and I have been working on the source code implementation, but I think that we will leave that for the next call. So that that would be something interesting to, to talk about the weights and how we can make this experiment something reliable along the time. But yeah, that's just a short uh, mention on that because there was some work on that previously exciting very exciting yeah uh th well thank you guys uh i would strongly recommend checking out the dow book club <clears throat> the it's in the dow discord which i believe livia linked to in the general channel right yeah yeah yes uh she in tc general so Check out the book club. Sadly, I have another call I have to do instead, uh, but I, I blocked it off in my calendar. I'm definitely going to go to these calls every week. We're reading Eleanor Ostrom's Governing the Commons. It's it's basically the book that is inspiring the common stack and the soft gov group and everything that we're doing. So even if you can't read the book, I'm sure that you'll glean a lot from everybody's personal cliff notes. So check it out, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, in the next one. <laughs>